Alright, hello and welcome to today's video. Today we're going to be talking about the various methods there are to improve your chess game and we're going to be doing this in the format of a tier list. And so basically S is going to be like the very best, F is like the bottom of the barrel and basically by the way the reason I want to make this video is because like there's so many different things you can do and to work on your chess and so I really want to make like one video to really like clarify what it is, like what it is it's just wasting your time, what it is it's kind of useful but not really and of course like what's like the absolute best use of your limited study time that you have available. But without further ado, let's get right into it. We're going to be starting off at the bottom with F tier. But I'm also going to leave timestamps, so if like you want to go straight to S tier, I mean, feel free to do so. And so as I said, we're starting off with F tier, and right off the bat, we're going to be talking about bullet chess. And uh, yeah, this unsurprisingly goes into F tier. And you know, one thing I'm going to say throughout this video is even you, you can take like a pretty like sort of non-conventional, maybe like not so great study method. And if you use it like well, I mean, you can probably make it into something useful, but bullet, sorry, bullet rather, is one of those things, we're going to be talking about bullets later, bullet, I just don't really see how it can be useful, like, there are some guys, there are a lot of strong players who play a lot of bullet, like, I'm not sure if that's useful to them, but personally, I've just never seen the sort of use in bullet, like, if you play one minute, like, there's just, I mean, maybe if you play with an increment, it's slightly better, but I just don't really see how you're going to be gaining much out of it, you're really just playing off of purely instinct and mouse speed, this just goes in the F tier. And so the next one's a little bit of a joke here. It's getting into arguments in Twitter about like just all sorts of random crap. We're not even talking politics, like just chess. I have people that love to argue me on Twitter for some reason and that's not improving their chess. So yeah, don't do that. Alright, so leaving the F tier there, I mean, as long as you avoid those two, I mean, you're not doing too bad in my opinion. Uh, but we're going to be going to the C tier now, which is like, you know, these methods, they have their uses, but in my opinion, they're not really the best uses of your time. And we're going to be starting off with playing versus a computer. It could be like Stockfish, Lina, I don't know. But in general, I'm not a big fan of playing versus computers. And in general, if you have an option, I would always take playing versus a human opponent over a computer. However, there are some like use cases where this could be useful. For example, if you want to drill like how to checkmate with two bishops versus a king, right? That could be useful. However, if it's like any other like random sort of position where it's like just equal, I mean the computer's like nine times out of ten just gonna absolutely rip you to shreds, and I don't really think that's fun for anyone. So I have a tough time really putting this anywhere above C tier. And so the next one's blindfold chess, or like anything involving like blindfold sort of training. To be honest, like I've never done anything like involving blindfold training. Like I probably have to some extent, like because I'm 2200, some level of blindfold ability, but it's probably not anything too special. And I mean, it might help me get to that next level, to be honest, but I don't think this is something you have to do. It can definitely help, especially like with calculation stuff, uh, but I don't really view it as necessary. And, okay, this one's gonna be fun, so chessable. And in particular, like, there's a lot of good material on chessable, I wanna be very clear about that. Uh, but as I talked about, I have a popular video on this channel called Chessable is Overrated, go check that out if you haven't already. But basically my criticism in that video was a lot of people just simply use chessable in a very brain dead way, the way they use a the move trainer. I actually used to be like this myself, so I'm not really trying to criticize anyone because, you know, I was that way once, I would just sort of like spam lines in chessboard and like that improved my openings a lot. Like I use it mainly for openings, I think most people do as well, I mean that's what sells the most, that's what they make the most of there. But quite frankly I haven't used chessboard in maybe close to two years now, like I've used stuff on there, just I haven't used the move trainer technology which is sort of their whole selling point, right? Simply because like, yeah like it works in terms of memorizing stuff, I'm not going to deny that. I've memorized lots of stuff with it before, that part works. The problem is, is that if you want to improve your chess, which is what we're talking about here, just purely memorizing more stuff isn't necessarily going to lead to more improvement, but once again, check out my video, Chessable is overrated. But carrying on with this, this one sort of has a similar point to the Chessable one, and this is uh, theoretical endgames here. We have 100 endgames, you must know as a thumbnail picture, I guess you call it, but I mean, that's just the most popular sort of book, I feel like, on theoretical endgames. And uh, yeah, what what is my opinion on theoretical endgames? Why am I putting this in C tier? I mean, I kind of get a lot of flack for this. I posted something on Twitter a while ago about how I don't believe theoretical endgames are that great a use of study time. And uh, I really do believe this. It's like there's some like fundamental stuff you need to know, right? Like with pawn and rook endgames, maybe some opposite called bishop stuff. I don't know. But like most of this stuff, like 100 endgames you must know. I mean, like probably not even like a third of that you really must know. 
if I were to count like and go through all the games I've ever played, I probably haven't even gotten more than half of the enemies, maybe more than one third as I've seen, that were in that book. And so while I'm not saying to like just completely not study theoretical endgames, understand that there is diminishing returns, like especially I've met people who like they're 1600 and they're like, oh I'm reading Divoretsky's endgame manual, like no dude, that's, that's a completely wrong way. And you know, it's not necessarily that studying theoretical endgames is useless, I just think that there's a very like strong level of diminishing returns after you sort of get the basics down, like some basic pawn, rook endgames, you don't really need to know a whole lot more than that, especially like at the under 2000 level, which is I believe the majority of my audience. And even if I'm being honest myself, a lot of like these theoretical endgames I don't really know so well, I'll be even more honest and say that the few times I've had bishop and knight versus king and blitz, I've butchered it, but I've never actually had it like over the board, so it hasn't really cost me in that sense. And I also want to touch on the fact that there seems to be this misconception that a lot of players have that studying theoretical endgames is the key to game better at endgames, and this is sort of like how people think just memorizing more opening theory will make the openings better. And the problem is with both of those things is that memorization is not the key, understanding is. A lot of players, and I believe this is why endgames are somewhat a strength of mine, is that I have a pretty good general like feel and understanding for end games, which did not come from just like going over all these theoretical end games. That came from like analyzing games and stuff, or like strong players and gain sort of practical experience. And for those of you who do want something more general in end game study, there's a book called Cherishevsky's End Game Strategy. I believe I haven't actually read that book personally, but that's one that is highly recommended by a lot of strong players. So if you're interested, that's a good book. Alright, and so for our final item in the CT, we're going to be putting Puzzle Rush in here. And uh, a lot of people sort of shit on Puzzle Rush. I don't really think it's as bad as a lot of people make it out to be. Some people have even said that it's going to make your chess worse, which again, I don't believe that. Some people have also said similar stuff about Blitz. But I actually could believe that, but quite frankly, Puzzle Rush, I mean, I don't think it's that bad. I also don't necessarily think this is something that you should be investing all of your time into, but if you say did like one puzzle rush a day to really just kind of keep yourself sharp, especially from all of these simple tactics, because a lot of the times it's like, you know, we focus on all this sort of like complicated tactics, all this like deep calculation, but all of the times the tactics we actually get in games are like these two to three move like really quick ones, and this to me is like the sort of big sort of um, selling point of doing puzzle rush. That being said though, if you have very limited time, I wouldn't really worry too much about Puzzle Rush, it's not something I'd invest a whole lot of time in. I myself haven't really been doing this so much recently as well, so uh, but yeah, I mean that's why we're putting it in the C tier. And so now moving on to the B tier here, the very first one I want to be putting in is sort of game com commentary, and this is a picture of Fabi and Robert Hess from the recent World Championships. But yeah, basically game commentary, I mean, I just think it's a good way to just like pick up stuff from like stronger players, right? And especially if you're like thinking along actively like with them and you're not just sort of like passively consuming whatever they're saying. And that's a thing with a lot of these study methods. The What you get out of it is really what you put in. So it's like if you're just like sort of like laying on the couch there on like a Sunday or something, like not really like thinking, then like you could technically say this is F tier, right? You could say that with just about any study method, to be honest, if you don't really put in any like conscious effort. But nonetheless, I think this can be quite useful. The reason I'm not putting this higher is because a lot of the times, I mean, the game commentary is on like very high level games. And uh, your mileage will vary a lot depending on your level, I believe. Like if I try to imagine myself going back to when I was like, 12 or 13 or something, I was like, I don't know, 1600 rated. I mean, like, I could sort of like listen to the game commentary and sort of think I am understanding what was going on, but to be honest, the, the level of difference is just so big that even with the sort of game commentary, there's a lot of stuff that I probably just wouldn't really be appreciating, but I mean, nonetheless, I mean, it is something that you can do and get some stuff out of, but I mean, it's also, I have to be honest, something that I have done occasionally, but like never really it's been a big focus. And so on a similar note here, uh, we're going to be putting it YouTube videos in the B tier. And again, this could be like C or even F tier, depending on who you watch, like no offense. But like if you're watching like Levy Rosman's videos or something, then it, okay, it depends on your level. Like if you're a pure beginner, maybe, but a lot of his stuff, to be honest, I've always just seen as more entertainment 
same with like these like chess hustler videos i mean like it's all kind of funny to watch but it's probably i mean if we're being honest not going to improve your chess a whole lot but if you watch guys like daniel naraditsky or chess dojo or hopefully my videos uh i do believe that these can be more useful and beneficial for your chess but once again it's like you get what you put in if you're just sort of like passively consuming it might not be the best use of your time but if you're sort of actively thinking along that's always going to get more out of like the content and so for the third and final item that we're going to be putting in the beat here it's a difficult to describe training method i'm not exactly sure what i'm gonna call it let's just say like quickly playing over like a very high volume of games and that might seem like Sam, like what the hell are you talking about? That's so ambiguous. But essentially, if you have like any sort of program that has like a database like Chessbase, I know everyone, not everyone has access to that. But this was actually a method talked about in a very popular book about pawn structures. I think it was just called Chess Structures, a Grandmaster Guide. It's a pretty well known book. But essentially, in the foreword of that book, not the guy who wrote the book, but like a friend of the author, he talked about one of his training methods, which essentially allowed him in his own words to basically look at any position for like two to three seconds and basically understand who is an advantage like what piece is a trade or like what the basic plans are for both sides and he attributed this like very powerful like intuition intuitive ability to what he did for many years which was just quickly playing over lots and lots of games and like he'd go of like one game like one to two minutes just like quickly like pressing like the forward button on like a computer right and just quickly playing over the moves and to a lot of people this will sound like a very like shallow like once again passive as i've been talking about earlier method of studying however if you're really engaged with the process and like trying to as he said in his own words like picking up the patterns that are like occurring throughout these games eventually over time some of that's going to sink into your brain and it's going to result in something and to myself i've probably done this to a lesser extent he, the guy who wrote this is like jim axel bachman he said he did this like with one, 100,000 plus grandmaster games i've probably done this on a much smaller scale like unconsciously uh but it, i definitely would say that this uh, would benefit your chest if you have something like chest base like for example just a sample use for how you could do this like if you had some very specific position you wanted to study like some position on move 15 and some opening i mean this is going to be more high on level of course but like say you want to study that more in depth you could just like go through the list of games that are there in the database click through one by one and you're going to pick up a lot of useful ideas very quickly all right and so now we're finally getting up to the higher tiers now we're getting into a tier and first of all what i'm going to be putting into a tier is blitz and again, this is something which like a lot of people sort of like dismiss and like, oh, Blitz isn't useful, this is like a waste of time, this is going to hurt your chest. But I really do disagree with this. And I've talked about this in my video before that I've made, like why you should play Blitz. But basically in that video, I talked about what I believe to be the two main benefits of Blitz, which are it improves your intuition because you're forced to make quick decisions. Not as quick as you are in Bullet, right? But like still in a relatively short time frame to the point where it can be useful and also it helps your opening sort of ability and your intuition also in the opening and basically as to the opening points because some people might not understand that basically my reasoning was and like i also should note that like i mentioned in that video if you're below 1600 you probably shouldn't be playing so much boots uh, just because like your intuition just isn't that developed yet so you're not going to get as much out of it but like especially as you get higher level and your openings become more important getting that high volume in of blitz games is going to allow you to sort of get a lot more experience in those openings as opposed to like when i was younger i didn't play much blitz at all because i was pretty bad at it and i didn't want to do something i was bad at i pretty much like a lot of the times i got some sort of opening on the board it would be like like over the board right it would be the very first time i ever practiced that position which isn't a very good thing you usually want to have at least a couple of blitz games to really sort of get a feel for the sort of positions before you get it in the more serious game that is for people who play like otb though and so reading books here this is going to be also in a tier i mean like it just kind of has to be right like it's one of the oldest methods of study in chess it's gotten a lot of players strong we have to put it up there there's a lot of good books out there. It's also the most sort of information dense way of just learning anything in general, chess included, right? So it just sort of has to be there. I feel like it's self explanatory. Once again, it's like, though, I mean, you get in what you put out. If you just sort of like play moves on the board, you don't really think about it. Like what's happening, then of course you're going to not get that much out of the books. If you also just buy a bunch of books and let them sit on your shelf, that doesn't really count either i hope that uh is self-explanatory though but nonetheless of course i mean chess books they're, they're pretty useful and uh, yeah so this one's gonna be a bit controversial i mean 
chest opening study i i believe this is a tier this will also depend on your level though once again like probably above 1500 it starts becoming more useful like 1500 otb i don't really understand the equivalent of like online chess.com rapid and all that stuff so i'm just gonna use otb because that's what i understand best but basically i believe chess opening study the, the reason it's useful is again it's not like as i mentioned in c tier right if you just memorize stuff through chess ball, that's not very useful but if you play like blitz games or you like actually go to the effort of like studying instructive games in those openings and understanding the typical middle game ideas that's pretty useful because i mean at the end of the day right you have to play the opening phase in every game you're going to get a middle game from that opening every game so why not kind of like and this isn't really just once again purely memorizing opening this is going to step beyond that and understanding the typical middle game positions you could even just call this like middle game study i guess but specifically studying middle games that arise from your openings that has always felt like to me a very sort of good way of studying chess and in terms of how you can do that i mean if you have a database program like chess base that is sort of the best thing you can get in my opinion but there are also like many books that contain like annotated games in those openings for example like the every man chess series like move by move those books usually contain like a lot of like 50 or so annotated games in the opening you know by strong like players who explain everything to you so that's also like a very good way of doing so but yeah nonetheless i think this is somewhat overlooked in some sense a lot of people like to crap on openings but it's just because like once again it's sort of it's not necessarily the method itself is bad it's more just the way people go about it it's not good in my opinion all right and so finally st here we're getting to the best of the best and first of all we're going to start off with the one of the most popular methods in my opinion this is probably well not my opinion i mean this is what i've probably done the most out of all the methods on this list maybe uh or at least one of the most which is doing some sort of solving whether that be calculation uh tactics like some book like that has a bunch of like positional puzzles there is if it's difficult and it's challenging you but like it's sort of like within that sweet spot right then i mean that just has to be st in my opinion do more of that you'll get better so the next one here is going to be doing some sort of um not chess boxing i know that's what i might sort of be implying here by this image here but rather sparring or doing some sort of training games and the thing I really like about this, especially if you target like a certain type of position you want to study and you have like a training partner who's around the same level, they also want to improve. I just don't think there's anything better than that really. That's one of like the very best forms of practice. I've always sort of, like, I mean, I've done a couple like sort of training sessions throughout the years with people and stuff, but honestly, it's never really been a big mainstay in my own training. I've always found it difficult to find people around my own level that also sort of have the same ambitions as me. So unfortunately, this is always, this has never really been a big part of my own regimen. Also, like you have to align people's schedules and stuff that can be difficult. But if you can do it, this is a very sort of good way of studying chess. And also, I mean, this is sort of, it should go without saying, we have a picture of Magnus and Nepo in the World Championship match here, but playing longer classical time control games, or even if it's like 15, 10, I mean, that's longer than Blitz, right? Like basically any sort of time control that gives you more time to think than your average Blitz game, pretty much, that's something that is worth doing. I mean, of course, it's ideal to do this OTB, but if you can't do that, there's like online chess leagues and stuff. I've talked a bit about this before. And of course, I mean, this is ideal to do over the board, but if you can't do that there's stuff like chess dojo they have their own league there's like some lead chess leagues that you can look into but yeah i mean playing longer time control games that's pretty self-explanatory and going along with that it also makes sense to include analyzing your games i i always analyze like pretty much every game i play to some extent even even ball games if i play them i don't play much ball to be honest but blitz like i will always analyze especially the opening phase but the the longer time control you get the more time that you spend on the game the more time you should also invest analyzing into it thinking about like your thought process specific like things that you did in the middle game that were wrong like all these technical things where could you have improved in the opening if you could like all that sort of stuff is sort of what you need to be doing when you're analyzing your games but i also probably at some point will make a separate video discussing this in more detail and so finally we have a picture of elon musk here you might be like once again saying like sam what the heck is this but uh, essentially what we're doing here is we're going to be talking about simulations because Elon Musk, as he said, he believes we live in a simulation. That's a separate topic though. Here in a chess context, simulation more so means simulating some sort of game. Like it could be just a random like famous game that you've never seen before, but you've heard people talk about. It could be like books in the game. You want to like go over them 
yourself before like you actually read the author's annotations and simulations are a great way to do this i've personally done this in the context of like i'll find some games in chess based on the opening i want to study and basically i'll just try to guess the moves of the game without actually like having the move notation open and so only then after i like simulate the game then i'll like see what they played and then gradually as I go through this process, I'll see like what moves like I got wrong and, I, and it gives you like a very immediate feedback. But how you can perform simulations in a concrete sense, I personally do this in chess space and I cover up like the notation on the side. I think you can probably also do this in some way like Lee Chess by just covering up the moves. I think you can probably also do that. But yeah, personally, I mean, I've always thought this was a pretty good study method. I should also mention though, that, like you could just like do this the old fashioned way and like have a book and like use a piece of paper to cover up the moves and then like slowly slide it down. Not a big fan of that. I mean, I guess you could do that. Sometimes you'll like, you'll accidentally see a move or something. That's kind of annoying. But yeah, I mean, yeah, simulations, pretty good in my opinion. Anyways though, that just about wraps it up for this video here. This is the chess improvement tiering list. If there's anything you think I missed or anything that I was wrong about, leave a comment down below. I'm happy to hear about it. But nonetheless, uh, yeah, also if you haven't liked the video already, please like it. And if you're not subscribed already, also subscribe to the channel for more content like this. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this and uh, have a good day.